and start to you say in faith there is victory. Where is your heart? Thank you for tuning in to Focus on Faith with your host, Russ Vickers. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Focus on Faith. I'm your host, Russ Vickers. We're so glad you could join us today. And uh, today we have Brock Kendall from Jonesboro, Arkansas. He's going to be speaking to us about how we need a revival. And uh, this sounds like a great lesson. So if you want to take your Bibles and follow along with us, we would certainly appreciate if you did. Again, thank you. And uh, Brock, go ahead. Well, thank you, Russ, for that. We're going to be looking at the topic today of we need a revival. I call your attention to Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. We're really going to diagnose, an aut we're going to do an autopsy, excuse me, of a dead congregation who is in need of a spiritual revival. We'll get there, we'll get there momentarily, but what I want to do is I want to define the word revive. You know, we talk about, um, and we also see uh, throughout congregations of God's people where we'll have gospel meetings or revivals from time to time. Many congregations do this today. And what we do is, um, or what, what congregations do when they have gospel meetings or revivals is they're wanting to have Christians collectively come out, hear the gospel preached, and to be encouraged by the preaching of the gospel, really to put a spark into them to want to cause them to do more for Jesus' kingdom. But friends, there could be a time where we as Christians, not only congregations, but individuals can go into a spiritual drought or spiritual depression, really. And if that ever comes, we are in need of a spiritual revival. And there was a congregation, a congregation of God's people in Revelation chapter 3, to whom John on the island of Patmos in exile wrote, to encourage them to come out of mediocrity or spiritual depression. The word revive, it simply means to flourish anew or to flourish again, literally, to regain life. To illustrate that point, do you remember Paul writing to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, Paul said, Therefore, if any man be in Christ... He is a new creature or a new creation. Old things passed away. Behold, all things become new. So you, were, you just go back to the time when you were immersed into Christ for the remission of your sins. You came out of that watery grave of baptism. You became a new creature. You were at an all-time high spiritually. Well, then you take years go by and then you go into a spiritual drought. Something happens whether you get caught up in what the world is doing, whether you get caught up in, in, in whatever's going on in your life that you neglect spiritual matters. Well, friends, I would say that that kind of individual is in need of a spiritual revival. Now, I would submit to you that not only do we need a revival spiritually, but in some cases we are in need of a revival morally. But friends, if we take care of our revival spiritually, it will cover the rest. And that is what we are focused on. We want to revive our souls when we go into a spiritual drought so that we can please the God of heaven. Isn't that what it's all about? Now, friends, the only cure to spiritual depression or a spiritual drought or indifference is Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God, in whom... All truth comes. Matthew chapter 11, 28 through 30, Jesus made this statement to a spiritual, religious, divided world. He said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Friends, you... You think about this idea of indifference, and maybe you have become indifferent to God's work. And friends, that happens to many of us from time to time. We get caught up in the cares of the world, 
and we just become careless. We lose interest in God's kingdom, the work of His kingdom. Therefore, we become mediocre. We're not making a difference anymore. A man was asked one time, it is said that the two greatest problems in the world are apathy and ignorance. To which he replied, I don't know and I don't care. You know, that's a lot of mindsets in local congregations of God's people. When I ask a question about spiritual matters, we reply, well, I don't know, I really don't care. We just, we show that we are not interested. Well, how can a person get that way? How does that happen to a person? Well, it's because they lose sight of what really matters in life. They lose sight of the spiritual things. So, go over to Revelation chapter 3, 14 through 22, and we read about a congregation of God's people at Laodicea. We call them the Laodiceans. I want to mention for just a moment about this city at Laodicea. This was one of the wealthiest cities in Asia Minor. One of the wealthiest cities in Asia Minor. We would refer to a city like this as the Wall Street of Asia Minor. But get this, it was destroyed by an earthquake in AD 60. Now why do I mention that? Because it's very interesting because they were so self-reliant, so self-satisfied with themselves that they did not seek or need outside help from other cities because they were so self-reliant. They even had a major or a popular clothing center and also a popular medical center um, which is referenced in verse 18. We'll get there momentarily. But I mention all of this because, friends, the city, the wealthy city of Laodicea, rubbed off on the called-out people of God in that city, Christians. Has that ever happened? Do we see that in congregations today? Yes, congregations can become mediocre, indifferent, because the world starts creeping into the church. One man said, uh, the church has too much world in it instead of the world having too much of the church in it. Well, that's true. We have lost our influence as Christians in many ways because of our lack of interest. And friends, if that's the case, we need a revival. We need to regain our spiritual life. Now, we, when we read about the church of La at Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22, we see that this congregation received no praise. Really, it's an autopsy of a dead church. And it's very interesting to me because there was no remnant. We don't even read about a faithful few who tried to encourage or pick up the slack of the others who were dying spiritually. It was this congregation was thoroughly disgusting to Christ. Look at the condition of the church at Laodicea, verse 15. The Bible says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. Literally, John is saying, or Jesus is saying through the hands of John, I wish you would choose one or the other. I wish you would be hot or cold, but because... Thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot. I will vomit you out of my mouth. So we see the condition of the church at Laodicea, verse 15. And it's very interesting to me because Jesus loved this congregation enough to tell them the truth. Friends, do we not have a passage of Scripture where Jesus Himself says, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you or set you free? Absolutely. Jesus Christ, John 14, 6, said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus Christ is the source of all truth, and He tells this dying congregation that I am disgusted by you because you're not either hot or cold, you're lukewarm. Literally, you're mediocre, you're indifferent. And because of that, I want to vomit you out of 
my mouth. In John chapter 6, in verse 63, Jesus said, It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing, but the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. This congregation had no zeal. They had no enthusiasm. They were not interested in the Lord's work. Really, by their actions, they showed to everyone else around them that they could care less. A really sad, sad state about this congregation. And when you think about what being hot, really being hot means you have a lot of conviction. You have a lot of enthusiasm. And if you're cold when it comes to the Lord's work, you could just care less. But they were lukewarm. Have you ever had a lukewarm glass of water? It's not a cold, ice cold glass of water, which that's what we love. Neither is it a hot glass of water, but it's lukewarm, literally in between. Now, if you drink a lukewarm glass of water, it is going to evoke vomiting. That's, that's the picture, the graphic, vivid picture that Jesus is painting here. Their state, spiritually, is causing Jesus to want to vomit them out of, their out of His mouth because of their indifference. They're not enthusiastic, nor have they completely renounced Him. They just have a name outside on the building, kind of like Sardis, the church at Sardis. They were form worshipers. They were worldly minded. I can just hear in the background these Christians at Laodicea making an excuse about everything. They were excusers. They would excuse themselves of doing the work. This is a congregation that was trying to maintain. You know, you can just hear them saying, you know, we're doing all right. We don't need any help. When the preacher gets up to preach the gospel, that, which, that, that soul saving message that pricks the heart of sinners, that changes the lives of those who are indifferent to God's kingdom if they receive, I can just hear them in the background saying, please stop challenging us. Please stop preaching these sermons that cause us to think, that cause us to get out of our comfort zone, that causes us to take risks. They weren't interested in this. Why? Because they were indifferent because of the city of Laodicea with all of their wealth and fame and fortune was rubbing off on them. Friends, we see the result of being worldly-minded. They had a negative attitude also toward good and evil. Another example of this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1-3. through 3, We read about the condition of the church at Corinth. The Bible tells us there that there was a fornicating brother at the church at Corinth. A fornicating brother. And the church at Corinth was very indifferent. They were told to purge out that leaven, that, that, leaven that, that, that sinful member. Because a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. A little sin can destroy an entire congregation. But the church at Corinth was very indifferent. They were mediocre. They were just not interested in this man's soul. Why? Well, the, the city at Corinth was also a very wealthy, idolatrous, self-sufficient city. They didn't feel like they needed any change and they didn't want to do what they were told to do by Paul. It is said that the heart of man, with all of its capacity, is not able to contain the Lord and the world at the same time. And oh, how true that is. Jesus on one occasion said, Lay not up for yourself treasures in heaven, or lay not up for yourself treasures on earth, excuse me, where rust and moth doth corrupt, or thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither rust nor moth doth corrupt, nor thieves break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lukewarm Christian will do more harm to the church than the unsaved sinner. Well, one would say, what? How can the lukewarm Christian do more harm to the church than the unsaved sinner? Well, friends, think about this. An inconsistent and hypocritical member exercises a deadly influence on a congregation. Matthew chapter 5, 
what we would call the thesis of the Sermon on the Mount. In verses 13 and 16, we read about Jesus speaking to the Jewish world. And he tells them, you're the salt of the earth, the light of the world. But if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be trodden under the foot of man. You know, the, the Jewish world should have been the salt of the earth. They should have been bringing others to God through their example, through their good influence, their godly influence, showing forth the praises of God by the way that they live. But they became very inconsistent. They became very hypocritical. They were play-acting Christianity, and it was rubbing off on everyone. And it caused frustration in the mind of Christ. And therefore, he tells us, except your righteousness exceeds that of the righteousness of the Pharisees and the scribes, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God, uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20. So we see what lukewarmness can do to the Christian. We see... What it has done to the congregation at Laodicea. But notice verse 16. Verse 16, the Bible says, So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. We see that God's going to reject these kind of Christians. Friends, if you're indifferent, if you're mediocre, if you are um, literally indifferent towards God's work, you need to repent. And you're in need of a spiritual revival. I'm very interested by this phrase, I will vomit you out of my mouth. And I'll tell you why. Because we read about a lot of emotions from God. In Genesis chapter 6, we read about God's grief because the world was, was bad during the times of Noah. It was evil. We read about God being a jealous God when He gave um, those commandments uh, at Mount Sinai to His people. We read about God's anger. We read about God's joy. We even read about God's love because He is love. But the emotion of disgust that evokes vomiting, this is the first time we read about this emotion. So it causes us to pay very close attention to why God would ever get to this emotion or ever have this kind of emotion. Well, what causes it? Lukewarm Christians indifferent Christians, Christians who are not interested in spiritual matters. Notice verse 17. Notice the deception involved. Verse 17, the Bible says, Because thou sayest I am rich. Notice that. They say. They say that I am rich and, and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Now notice They say that they are rich. They think that they are okay. Now, why would they ever get to this point where they think that they are okay? Well, friends, the city, all the deadly influences has rubbed off on them. And because they have been deceived through their riches, through their own wisdom, their own reasoning, God says, I'm going to reject you. I don't want to have anything to do with you. Matter of fact, he goes on to say you need to repent. You see, those rich and material material goods are usually over, overly confident. They think that these riches that they have will offer them something in light of the spiritual realm. But the city with all its wealth was so self-satisfied. And then Jesus says, you guys are poor, spiritually speaking. You guys are blind to your own blindness. They were immodestly dressed spiritually. And the saddest thing about their condition is they thought that they were okay. In Matthew chapter 15, we have in about verse 14 where Jesus says to the Pharisees or to his disciples about the Pharisees, leave them alone or let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind shall follow the blind, they shall both fall into a ditch. You see... The condemnation for false teachers is the same to those that follow the false teachers. If you have been deceived by this world and all its glory and fame and fortune, if you have been deceived by false teaching, if you have been deceived by man, if you have been deceived by your own heart, it could cause your rejection. And you're blind. And you're blind to your own blindness. Now... With every negative 
connotation that we have in the Bible, there's always the positive as well. And in verse 18, the Lord gives the remedy, the antidote, the cure, if you will, to mediocrity or indifference. Notice verse 18. He says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Now what got them to the place of indifference? Their own wisdom. You remember verse um, verse 17, the Bible says, they say, and now Jesus is saying, but I say. All right, so the reason why they have become mediocre is because of their own reasoning. Their own mindset has led them to this. One has said that the worth of Christianity could not be better expressed than by refined gold. It's very interesting that they were naked, not naked spirit or physically, but they were naked spiritually. And Jesus says you need to put on your modest, your spiritually modest clothes, white raiment, which I believe could refer to righteousness that protects the soul. In 1 John 3, 7, the Bible says, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Well, what is righteousness? Well, it's right doing. If I want to be pleasing to God, if I want to be dressed spiritually, I need to do those things that are right and pleasing in God's sight. We have a passage that tells us about, or the psalmist wrote, that God's commandments are righteousness. Then he says, you need to put on some eye salve. Remember, the city at Laodicea was very popular. They had a medical center. And this medical center had um, an ointment known as eye salve that would help the eyes when they were in need, when they were uh, not working properly. But Jesus speaks from a spiritual matter. You need to put on eye salve, spiritually speaking, which I think could refer to faith, trust, renew their strength, renew their faith in Christ. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Th 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5. Friends, there's not a person loved of the Father that escapes discipline. All right? If the Father loves us, He is going to correct us from time to time. This congregation at Laodicea needed to realize that they needed to be corrected by God's Word so they can get back in the position where God wants them. Then in verses 20, in conclusion, verses 20 through 22, we find that Jesus is standing at the door and He's knocking and He's wanting in. He's on the outside looking in. You know, Jesus has never been invited in by most people in this world. And it's unfortunate that He's on the outside because He's been driven out by many lukewarm members. Many lukewarm, mediocre, indifferent members would just rather not have Jesus, His teachings that is, come into their building. They don't want to be challenged by Jesus' words. They know that if Jesus were to come in and the gospel was to be preached in its entirety, that they would have to make some changes. Well, when I don't want to change, it's because I'm lazy, I'm slothful, and I'm indifferent to God's kingdom. But friends, the Bible calls for change. I don't read the Bible for curiosity. I don't read the Bible just because I'm interested in reading a book. I read the Bible because I am told to be a doer of the things that I read, James 1, 22. We're told to look into the perfect law of liberty and to continue therein and be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. That's the man that should be blessed in his deed, James chapter 1 and 25. So I need to take the handle off the door of mediocrity or indifference and allow God through His Son Jesus Christ to give me a revival through the words that He gives me as laid out in the New Testament. Friends, we need more of God's Word and we need more zeal. Uh, thank you, Russ, for having us uh, today on this program. Brock, what a great lesson. Thank you so much. You know, we do need revivals today. We need to be revived in our spirit. We need to be revived in our hearts and revived in our minds because there are times when we feel like our battery has just run down and we need to be picked back up by God and His Word. 
You know, Brock was spot on concerning the examination of uh, the church at Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. Revivals are definitely needed today because, yes, we are in a spiritual drought of sorts. Uh, there's a lot of indifference that is in this nation right now concerning religious matters. And so we do need a revival. Jesus is the answer. And the great invitation of Christ, Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That is still, uh, uh, it still applies to us today. And so Jesus does provide rest. A great invitation for a world needing a spiritual revival. Now, people lose interest in God's kingdom. I think two of the greatest problems that we have right now are apathy and ignorance, great problems in the church as well as in the world today. And we lose sight of the spiritual things. You know, these Laodiceans, they were very lukewarm. They were very apathetic. Uh, they were a wealthy city and very reliant, thinking that they needed no help from anyone. So there was a bit of a pride issue there, too, with the Laodiceans. We, in many areas, have lost our influence as Christians in the world. We need to get that influence back. We need to stop being apathetic. We need to stop being indifferent. And, and the question is, are we going to be hot or cold for the Lord? What's it going to be? Uh, the Lord cannot stand a lukewarm people. So what we need these days, we need interest, we need zeal, and we need enthusiasm for the work of the Lord. It's needed today more than ever. And we have to be challenged by teaching and preaching to work for the kingdom. If we are worldly minded toward Christ, the church, morality, truth, good and evil, then we are surely drifting without a chart or compass. Corinth was a very wealthy, self-sufficient city. But the problem with Corinth was is that they were wicked, they were idolatrous and sexually immoral. One of the largest cities, they, they were one of the largest cities of the, of the ancient world. We cannot love both God and the world in our hearts. There's no middle ground, there's no gray area. Uh, we either love God and follow Him and obey Him, or we don't. It's just as simple as that. So the question is, are we going to be the salt of the earth? Are we going to be the light in the world, uh, light of the world? And we need to be revived. We need revival, and we need it right now. Or the Lord will reject us, and really, who wants that? We have enough lukewarm Christianity out there today. Friends, thank you for watching the program today. Again, I'm your host, Russ Vickers. And as always, focus on faith. God bless. Where there is victory.